Um, today, I am going to be talking about Traveling Black, uh, which is a book that explores the intertwined history of travel segregation and Black struggles for freedom of movement. Um, it's organized around the successive forms of transportation that Americans have used to cross the country. And it looks at the experiences of generations of African-American travelers as they encountered and resisted segregation and discrimination on stagecoaches, ships, cars, buses, um, and even airplanes. Um, in doing so, it documents an African-American struggle for freedom of mobility that falls largely outside of the organizational history of the civil rights movement. It's a history that we are sort of only really beginning to recover. And I got kind of intrigued with trying to put it together. So in trying to put together, the book kind of looks at this sort of moving color line um, that's shaped not only by regional racial politics that produce things like Jim Crow laws and Jim Crow cars, um, but also, um, Social, um, social divisions and prejudices. And it looks at the way this all works together at a time when you had Jim Crow cars and buses literally crossing the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and you're also entering a world in which transportation is changing um, and it's becoming ever more important race, class, and gender in kind of the public world. So I want to just kind of really quickly with, with a lot of pictures, try to give you a sense of the story the book tells. Um, it starts with really the beginning of common carriers or public transportation, things that are not your own private car or private buggy or horse or ship. Uh, stage travel, some of the earliest forms of segregation take shape on stagecoaches and steam steamboats. Um, these kind of really old fashioned forms of travel always had some spaces that were better than others. So on stagecoaches, the servants um, would travel on the outside of the coach, as you see here. And that was normally where um, African Americans who in the early 1800s when stagecoaches first become common are generally sitting on the outside of stagecoaches. They're traveling on the decks of steamships. Um, and then when railroads come along starting around the 1830s, when they really become common, um, they, they, a system of segregation is adopted where African-Americans and often servants, immigrants, people of lower class are put in a separate space. Uh, the first Jim Crow cars as the cars that Black people had to ride in came to be known are actually um, found in the antebellum era north in, in the northern states. Um, Trains were trains really became a common form of transportation first in these states in New England and New York, um, and there they had Jim Crow cars, uh, which were cars that rode at the front of the train, uh, right behind the engine, uh, and they would often be where African Americans were asked to ride. Um, Eventually in the North African Americans would fight their way out of Jim Crow cars, but um, things did not generally improve for black travelers after the Civil War. Um, by the late 19th century, uh, you had a population of relatively recently emancipated people um, who were subject to increasing levels of discrimination in the South. And a lot of the, 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 the sort of return to white supremacy that takes place in the South after Reconstruction is really about controlling, uh, controlling how black and whites encounter each other in space, making sure that white supremacy is sort of observed in daily interactions. And the railroad becomes a really central place where this happens. The 1880s, the period that you see in this print advertisement is on the one hand, a time in which, which is known as the golden age of American railroads when there were really sort of lavish accommodations on railroads. Here you see a group of people in eating in a dining car. Um, it was also the golden age of American railroads was also a time when railroads handled pretty much 
almost all of intercity passenger transportation, as well as most freight, um, and traversed millions of miles of track. So it was a time when everyone took the train, but it was a time when people took it on very different terms. Um, for African Americans during the golden age of railroads, um, accommodations actually uh, got worse over time. In the South, where you have an emerging system of um, Jim Crow segregation, uh, separate car laws began to be passed in the 1880s that relegated Blacks to a special uh, Jim Crow car, much like they had traveled in an early Massachusetts. Um, and that would become a broad um, and Supreme Court supported law by 1896, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, the famous case that maintains that blacks, blacks and whites can be separate, but equal is actually a, a ruling about a railroad case. And what it did was it relegated blacks to these colored cars as they were known or Jim Crow cars. So let me just talk a little bit about them because they for many African-Americans really became the metaphor for sort of black inferiority. It, they were sort of the, the sort of object that kind of demonstrated it was like they were vastly inferior to the kind of accommodations whites generally traveled in. They were usually the oldest, dirtiest cars on the road. Um, they often had other purposes as well. They would also serve as the luggage car. They were frequently accommodated white smokers. Um, they, had, um, they had less restrooms in the sense that they had two restrooms, but since half, half of them were dedicated to being a white smoking car, they, had, they didn't have restrooms for men and women, which was normal on the regular passenger cars. Um, and they had other really striking deficits as well. The institutionalization of Jim Crow takes place at a time when railroads are beginning to provide their non-Jim Crow passengers with an ever more safe and comfortable ride. In the 1880s, for instance, railroads across the country began to replace oil lamps and coal stoves um, which had traditionally provided light and heat to passengers with electric lights and new steam heating systems um, that were both cleaner and less flammable. Advertisements for these kind of improvements um, in trade journals would say things like no more passengers burned alive, which underscores that 19th century railroads were dangerous and they were more dangerous if they were kind of antiquated. Um, and nowhere did this become clear in a phenomenon that really begins to develop uh, towards the beginning of the 20th century, which is a phenomenon which Black newspapers often called the Jim Crow car crash. And, and what began to happen in the early years of the 20th century as the as trains modernized and increasingly the main, the sort of white passenger car trains would be all these all metal up-to-date trains, um, Jim Crow cars would still be these old wooden trains. And you began to have a series of train wrecks, which were themselves not uncommon during this time period. But in the early 20th century, because the Jim Crow car was the only wooden car on the train, you would get these train, train wrecks in which virtually everyone who was injured and die or and or died um, was traveling in the Jim Crow car. So here um, I have a photograph of the excursion train wreck of 1911, which is a case in point. It was a collision between a freight train and a passenger train that killed eight people, all of whom were black. Um, so too were those injured in that crash. Um, and the most, the biggest train wreck of the 20th century, the uh, Nashville train wreck of 1918 uh, was even worse. It was a head-on collision between a Chattanooga and St. Louis railroad train and another train from the same railroad that killed 121 people, more than 70% of whom were Black. So accordingly, by the by the early 20th century, you had African-American newspapers really describing these events as Jim Crow train wrecks um, and keeping count of who died. Um, 
Blacks also filed official complaints with railroad commissions and state governments, but um, and even even brought it up before Congress, but nothing ever changed. There would be Jim Crow train wrecks through the er, through to 1951, which is when the last one occurred, the last one of these train wrecks in which a Jim Crow car is smashed. So not surprisingly, given that riding in the train was a sort of visceral experience of second-class citizenship. African Americans um, were eager to adapt new forms of transportation as they came along, and this is one of the book's sort of central themes. Um, the advent of automotive technology, such as cars and buses, um, was welcomed by all Americans, but it was particularly something that was really seen as a moment of great hope among African Americans. Um, even in the very early years of the 20th century when cars were still expensive, difficult to drive, prone to break down and also likely to be stranded on the sort of mud roads that existed then, um, blacks who could afford them bought them early. One of the early adapters was Jack Johnson who won the world prize, world heavyweight title in 1908. Jack Johnson was a big swaggering black man who carried himself with lots of confidence um, and was too proud and hot-headed to be trapped comfortable traveling Jim Crow. So he bought many cars he, um, and he loved driving. Um, and But his experiences in cars also illustrated that driving would have a particular sort of racialized would be a racialized experience for African Americans. Um, Johnson's mastery of boxing sweet science was a challenge uh, to many whites and so too was his love of cars. Um, by 1909, uh, when he owned five cars, um, his command of car drew hostility and harassment among policemen wherever he met. Wherever he went, he received tickets for speeding, reckless driving, obstructing traffic, um, and other move, moving violations whenever he drove. None of this actually discouraged Jack Johnson. He parked his cars on the sidewalk in Toronto, in Chicago, and once told the judge his constant speeding was simply done for advertising purposes. Um, but he was very aware that it had something to do with his race. He once said that he thought he was being charged because he was a brunette in a blonde town. Um, so he's one person, but it's not just uh, wealthy and prominent African-Americans. Also working class Blacks began to buy cars fairly early on. As early as World War I, black sharecroppers would use their agricultural earnings on a good year to buy cars. Um, and all of this was in hopes of gaining some independence um, and gaining some kind of escape from the Jim Crow car, which had become something that everyone detested. In addition, blacks also organized very early Jim Crow jitney bus lines. Um, these were um, usually municipal transportation ser services that competed with the streetcars, which in the South were also segregated. Um, so black entrepreneurs in Austin and other Texas towns as well as throughout the South tried to compete and spare people the humiliation of Jim Crow um, streetcars uh, by offering these jitneys operated by Negroes and for, for Negroes. Some of these would expand into intercity bus services. Um, but overall, the jitney, the whole sort of jitney moment um, and these small bus lines would have trouble competing against municipal transportation services and also against larger bus lines. But all of this sort of underscored the ways in which African Americans were continuing to scramble to find ways to travel where they did not feel like they were relegated to um, unpleasant and uncomfortable accommodations. Um, and this was a problem they were experiencing on buses during these years. They were trying to create their own bus lines. Um, they were finding that early bus lines often refused to pick up black passengers. Um, 
And if they did pick them up, they often um, did not um, have any place for them to sort of, if they stopped, there was no place where African Americans could use the bathroom or use restaurants on many of the sort of long distance travels. Um, they were also, once they began to be picked up, relegated to the back of the bus. Um, so with all these defi deficits, um, neither cars or buses would really end up offering Blacks a genuine escape from Jim Crow. Um, cars were definitely the best option, um, but traveling by car or bus is not a truly private experience. Driving any distance requires using a multitude of different services from gas stations to motels to roadside restaurants um, that you always have to stop. It uh, requires entering what sociologists call a system of automobility. Um, and that system, which develops alongside roads, highways, and a kind of car, car system is one that would become increasingly racialized um, over time. Um, these experiences of Blacks who could not ride buses or could not find places to um, eat or um, use the bathroom on tra on, while traveling is one example of this. Um, and those kind of experiences would affect even people who drove their own private cars. Um, one of the things that really surprised me in the research for this book is that I found numerous references to from Africa complaints from African American travelers about um, not being stopping at gas stations where the gas station owners um, and employees did not want to sell gas to black people. And I was really curious about why this is happening so much so that I began to research the history of the gas station, at which point it sort of becomes clear gas stations originate um, as a way to sell largely in indistinguishable products, gas, motor oil things um, to this, um, to consumers and they have to kind of market themselves um, before gas stations, um, gas was typically sold at hardware stores. It was sold mostly to men. And by the time you have the advent of the gas station, you begin to have a network of gas stations where they're trying to attract female consumers. They're trying to make the whole experience easier and more welcoming. So they begin to model gas stations on this totally domestic model. This is why I'm showing you this picture. Gas stations often look like cottages, which is no accident. It was a deliberate attempt on the part of gas station owners to kind of make gas stations into this comfortable domestic space. Um, and this seems to have been why uh, many gas stations uh, were places where Blacks were not particularly welcome. Even where African Americans could buy ga gas, um, they weren't welcome to go to the bathroom. In, the South, this was a matter of law. Separate bathrooms were required for Blacks and whites and gas stations generally simply did not offer a Black bathroom. Um, but this thing of not welcoming Black customers uh, could be found elsewhere in the country. Gas stations could be very unfriendly um, to Black drivers because uh, they really catered to sort of white, the model of a sort of white middle-class driver. Um, which is evident even in the kind of advertising for gas, um, which sort of emphasized how clean and clean and lovely the gas stations were and had sort of pictures of uh, white women and children. And uh, Texaco even had a sort of white patrol that went around looking to see if the bathrooms were clean, but also kind of underscores the ways in which uh, these gas stations tended to serve whites. So these kind of problems were a genuine inconvenience and meant that from very early on, African-Americans really had to think about where they could stop and get services. Driving uh, presented other racialized dilemmas as well. Um, in the deep South, especially driving itself was complicated by race. Um, 
In some Southern states, Jim Crow etiquette initially extended even to the rules of the road. Um, at many four-way intersections in this area, the right-of-way was for a time de determined more by race than by who, who got there first. Um, the idea was that Blacks should generally defer to whites, which was sort of the custom from um, interactions on the sidewalk that had been around for many years. Um, this sort of system did not work well at four-way stops, and it did not sort of end up being a successful system there, but there were customs around the passing of white drivers on slow roads and Mississippi local custom dictated that blacks shouldn't overtake white drivers on unpaved roads. Um, and there was always a little bit of a sense of right away around color. And this was, um, um, these kind of conflicts uh, were sort of things that African Americans really needed to avoid because um, there was in both the North and the South problems around insurance that Black drivers faced. Um, in insurance, they faced another kind of racial right away if they got into any kind of accident. Um, in, the, in both the North and the South, um, automobile insurance companies did not want to insure Blacks. Um, and they were quite frank about why. They said that um, African-American drivers would always be held at fault within the court system so that they were a very risky, too risky to insure. Um, and Blacks would not routinely be able to get automobile insurance until the 40s and 50s when most states moved towards some sort of mandatory um, car insurance system, which meant that they had to find ways to make sure that everyone could get insurance. Um, so, as I said, buses and cars would both have their problems, um, and these, especially in buses, would really would really center around things like accommodations. Where could blacks stop? Um, you would have white white women only rest stations, rest in rest stops for Greyhound bus passengers, the separate accommodation for colored passengers, if available, would often be very sort of minimalist, as you can see here um, in the colored dining room sign. They were often at the back of something. They often involved eating outside um, and involved a kind of certain ritual humiliation, as well as considerable inconvenience in the places where there were really no services for Black people. Um, a separate economy of, of tourist cabins, hotels, and other things for Black people does emerge during the segregation era. It's always a bit, it's never quite adequate to people's needs. Um, and um, it's never, never really has enough capital to become really comfortable, but it does become important for African Americans to try to figure out where they will stay. And for this reason, you begin to see the proliferation of various guidebooks and lists um, that African Americans use to find things. You probably heard of the Green Book, which starts very early on, um, but it's actually predate it. it um, the Green Book starts in, in, in the late 30s. The first one actually dates back until to 1929, Hackley and Harrison's Hotel and Apartment Guide. They list where people can stop. Um, and if you look at what they say, um, a lot of the places that they list are people's individual houses, places where people let a room. There really is not a lot of accommodations um, and it illustrates how challenging it could be for African-Americans to find a place to stay while driving um, any length distance. They would proliferate over time. You would begin to get the Green Book um, and, and others as well, Travel Guide, Grayson's Guide, um, all designed to help find, make sure that people found welcoming places to stay, to eat, places where they could buy gas. Um, again, you see listings. This is from inside the Green Book, uh, which listed even barber shops and taverns and garages. Um, 
However, even when African Americans employed such grant guides, they often found road trips difficult and sometimes dangerous. Um, the guide books were not always up to date. Um, and there was um, cruising into town, they never quite knew who they were going to encounter. Um, so they always could not feel completely confident that they would find a place to stay or find the right part of town. So not surprisingly, African-Americans took to flying with great enthusiasm as well. Um, with flying, again, there was this hope that, that it would simply, uh, simply eradicate Jim Crow. Um, African-American Air Force pilot William Ellis predicted it would squeeze out Jim Crow. Um, but on the other hand, by the time planes come along, you do have these ideas about Blacks and technology. Um, and, and there is sort of this idea that there's going to be some kind of segregation aloft. That does not actually happen formally, according to the law, but there are divisions in flying from the beginning as well. Blacks are excluded from many early sort of recreational airfields. Um, and a, a forms of segregation develop on the ground. Here you see a photograph in 1961 that shows the location of colored waiting rooms in the Dally Field Airport in Alabama. This, this was sort of the norm. And there were also certain systems of segregating seating, um, mostly informal. Um, stewards and st stewardesses would put people put black people in the same row during the early years of flying. There was a certain front seat they often seated black people in. Um, and African-Americans were also first in line for any kind of travel disruption. Um, Ella Fitzgerald was bumped off a plane in Honolulu en route to Australia. And this was a fairly typical experience for black flyer flyers if whites <laughs> If there were important white passengers who needed seats, they would often bump black passengers off. And all this meant that flying for all people had high hopes for it would not prove as liberating as people hoped. Um, flying throughout this time period up through the 50s was very expensive. And for African Americans, it could be really interrupted by things like um, if you're, if you, got stuck at the airport switching planes or something, you might not be able to get anything to eat at the airport because there was no white dining hall. Um, airports in the South were served by cab companies that served either whites or blacks. So some black travelers had the experience of taking a sort of smooth flight somewhere and then being sort of unable to get from the airport to their final destination. Um, all of this would mean that flying would like other forms of trans transportation require civil rights struggles to be truly liberated. Um, here you see the Tallahassee 10 who um, um, participated in the freedom rides of the 1961 um, and at the end of their journey flew back home only to be greeted with segregation in the Tallahassee airport, um, which they protested and got jailed for, um, and that underscores that we don't usually think of airports as segregated they were. Um, and it also underscores the ways in which all forms of transportation really required this massive civil rights struggle um, to finally bring an end to formal segregation. Um, and that's sort of where we are now, though I would just say in closing that one of the things we need to think about um, in thinking about this story in our present day context are the many ways in which there are still dramatic travel inequities in the United States, in American life. Um, the post-war period saw great um, suburbanization and an increasing dependence among cars for all Americans. Um, that, that sort of transformation meant that even though after the 1960s, you have no formal segregation on trains and buses, you also don't have a lot of trains and buses. We now have only one real passenger rail service. Um, traveling between cities, Amtrak, and very limited bus coverage as well. Um, and Blacks um, and Hispanics are 
disproportionately less likely to own cars than whites. So you still have these sort of inequities in travel and transportation, which were most dramatically revealed um, when Hurricane Katrina devastated New Orleans um, some years ago. And we saw that most of the people stranded in New Orleans were African-American. Um, they were stranded there, at least in part, because New Orleans um, evacuation plan actually did not address the question of how to get people who did not own cars out of town. It, uh, there was a whole evacuation plan involved in rerouting the highways, but for those who did not own cars, the only advice the city officials had to give was find someone who had a car, which as we saw, didn't work out very well. Um, another ongoing area of inequity, just to sort of keep in mind, um, um, is of course racial profiling and policing, uh, which has become an increasingly important problem um, dating back to the Reagan era when um, one of the ways in which the police began to kind of seek out drug offenders was simply by stopping people on the roads and searching cars for drugs. Um, and this continues to be something that shapes the African-American experience of race on the road. So on the one hand, my book tells a story in which African-Americans uh, fight hard to achieve equity in transportation and in many ways make remarkable strides in terms of breaking down the system of um, formal Jim Crow. Um, we no longer have um, colored and white signs, no longer have Blacks riding at the back of the bus or sitting in the Jim Crow car. But on the other hand, we do have ongoing inequities um, that people are continuing to fight against. So I'll stop there and open up the discussion and see what people think. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bay. Wow. Um, I would I want to encourage our, uh, our audience to please go to the Q&A portion uh, on your screen and send your questions so that we can um, dig into them and explore a little bit more this really pretty remarkable story that you've laid out for us. I think uh, I can't help but feeling as I, as I think about the challenge of transportation, whether it is a stagecoach in you know, the, the 18th century or whether it's trains when they're coming onto the scene or any of the other transportation changes, uh, it, it's almost palatable the sense of opportunity or hope that that must have engendered in folks who had so few options. Um, and yet um, to have, to invest yourself in the, the hope that this will change things um, mm -hmm. and to continually get beaten down by the, the long persistence of, um, of the very basis of Jim Crow culture and life. It's just, and, and I'm just listening to it as a white man, it's exhausting. And I can't imagine how, uh, how much courage you'd have to muster just to make that trip with your family to try and have a vacation or, seek out a, a visit a, a, a relative or seek out a, a new town to live in. It, it, it just sounds exhausting to me. Um, yeah, so I agree. I mean, I re reading this book, I was often feeling like I'm surprised that black people went anywhere at all. Um, but on the other hand, you know, that was kind of the dilemma. I mean, you know, we sometimes think of travel as like tourism, but but this period of time, you know, from, from the 1830s through to the present day, we have the Great Migration, we have world wars, uh, we have, um, you know, the Great Migration moves almost half of the Black population north, and then you have, you know, a, a, a nation of people with relatives in the south going back and forth, the wars move everyone around, so moving around is not really a choice, it's also in this country, often it's necessary to travel to achieve better work, you know, to follow work opportunities. So people didn't really have much choice about moving. 
Um, poor people often had to follow the work. Um, even black people who were well-to-do people who were like race leaders, like from Booker T. Washington to W.B. Du Bois to Martin Luther King, they had to travel to kind of to lead the race. So everyone was kind of on the road, even though it was very difficult. And this was one reason why travel discrimination became a really central issue mm-hmm. over and over again um, in the sort of long history of the civil rights movement. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned in your remarks um, uh, how some African Americans created networks of their own, whether it's the Jitney service uh, or something maybe more elaborate, although that sounds pretty elaborate. Um, mm-hmm. How success, I mean, can you tell us any examples of, of real success in that area? I know you mentioned that they're up against, you know, public transportation and yeah. when tax money gets put into that, it's, it's going to be hard to compete. But any well, Jitney's, the- Jitney's services, both black and white, were kind of legislated out of existence on the municipal level fairly quickly because they were really disruptive. They posed insurance problems. They competed with the streetcars. So... But what did survive out of Jitney services were, you know, what we know today as bus camp companies. Greyhound originated as a Jitney service. And there were some, it was something called the Safe Bus Company in North Carolina that was around for many years. Um, there was another comp- uh, a bus company um, in Philadelphia that went ran be- between Darby, which is now a sort of suburb of the main line. And Philadelphia that also ran for many, it ran until SEPTA came along and, and took all the, so, so were, there were some of those, but um, uh, most of them actually then would end up being bought up by larger bus lines eventually. Yeah. And so before Brown versus Board of Education, um, when you have a, a pretty strict segregated education system, and even for long after uh, Brown mm-hmm. versus Board, um, I, I'm thinking here about school buses. One of our uh, listeners tonight is wondering how did segregation uh, and color play into free ed, uh, free transportation for public education? Well, that's a, that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, transportation is everywhere in the sort of civil rights struggle. One of the cases in Brown is actually a case brought by parents who initially just want a school bus. Their kids um, are having to walk as many as nine miles to get to school because that, well, because there is no school school bus for the black school, Um, that's not funded. And this is not an uncommon thing. So um, they, um, they're, you know, what they want in the way of equal education starts out as just a school bus. Um, And eventually when it goes into the, when it folds into the five cases that are brown, the the whole goal becomes broader. But um, yeah, so school buses are are funded or not funded by the school boards. And um, for many African-Americans, there there is no bus and getting to school is a real issue. Yeah, yeah. And taxis, where do taxis, I mean, are they kind of akin to this jitney system or are they an entity in their own right? In the South, taxis ended up in many areas being either white or black taxis. Um, Sometimes it was required by law, sometimes it was customary. Um, And what was really challenging for African-American travelers is they didn't always know going to a new place in the South, whether they could get a taxi, like whether the taxis would serve them or not. Um, but it was it was very highly regulated. And some of this stuff kind of had to do with labor, like the idea that white men should not be serving black customers. So there was there would be the black taxi company with maybe a black driver, and then there would be the white taxi company, and they would only serve white passengers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know as Pennsylvanians, we um, frequently pat ourselves on the back of, uh, as having had the first turnpike in the nation. Um, and But I'm thinking about the turnpike, uh, was it the 1930s when, um, I, I don't even remember exactly when, what we know today is the Pennsylvania turnpike started, but mm-hmm. um, that's a toll road. Um, mm-hmm. Presumably it was always a toll road. Uh, were there discrimination did, did did blacks face discrimination 
in terms of being able to even get on any of those toll roads, or was it simply a matter of if you have the money, you can you can travel the route? I have never heard any any complaints about being able to get on toll roads, but Pennsylvania has other history of remarkable history of discrimination. Um, Pennsylvania was the site for a real struggle over buses at one point because in Pennsylvania. Um, um, blacks were often being asked to ride in the back of the bus, even though there was no state law around it. Um, in Pennsylvania, blacks were some, often put in the Jim Crow car before this train got to the south. So, so mm -hmm. there was these kind. Of, this kind of discrimination was pretty common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, really interesting question that just um, has been posed by one of our viewers. And it's trying to to make links between uh, the the clever modes of transportation that were part of the Underground Railroad, having mm -hmm. to come up with ways to secret people through spaces. Um, does any of what we see and what we know about how the Underground Railroad functioned, and it functioned in, in many multiple sorts of ways, and any implications for that for how um, Black Americans would travel once transportation became more possible? That's a great question. And I think there is. is because there was a kind of network, a sort of, you know, network of information around how to travel and special routes that was, was part of how people navigated it. These kind of guidebooks I was referencing grew out of lists that like Black jazz musicians and entertainers used to pass around about where you could stay. Um, and people also had these modes of getting information, like you would go into town and you would ask the mailman if there was a black mailman or you'd ask the porter, you know, to find information. And people also had this, these systems for traveling safely, like a lot of people would drive at night to avoid notice. Some of the people would take back roads when the interstates would complete. People preferred the interstate over the black, over the back roads. There was a constant sort of flow of information about what's the safe way to travel, what are the spots you need to avoid, where are the sundown towns, where are the gas stations that will not sell, sell you gas. So in that sense, it um, people were not obviously being hunted the same way they were in, in traveling in the Underground Railroad, but travel had that sense of danger and something that you had to find community support to do. Right, right. Here in Lancaster, we have a pretty remarkable example of um, uh, of Underground Railroad activity with uh, Oliver Cromwell Gilbert arriving in Columbia uh, and being instructed to uh, move east to South Queen Street to Mr. Stevens, a home of the, a friend of the slave. Um, and I'm thinking about that documented example as um, almost a precursor in some ways, although under very different circumstances, to the Green Book, that, that mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got a network in place. Um, it, it operates sub rosa, but um, it, uh, it helps to get people safely from one place uh, to another. Um, another one of our uh, uh, listeners tonight would love to hear your thoughts about um, inequities that are still apparent in transportation. Um, and, uh, and they're asking, is this really more a question of caste or is it a question of race or maybe a little bit of both? I think it's a question that, that sort of highlights the ways in which race and class intersect in this country. Um, I mean, we, we have kind of illusions about, we, in some ways we're a very, we are a society that thinks of itself as very democratic. But on the other hand, we do have a lot of sort of, we do have divisions of class, which are really prominent in travel in particular. I mean, every time I fly, maybe because I always choose the cheap seats, I'm always aware that everyone must know that I didn't pay a lot for my ticket because I get on like absolutely last. Um, but, um, you know, what you see is um, there's many complaints among Blacks who travel first class that people tell them they're in the wrong line, they're in the wrong seat, and they're in the wrong section. There is this kind of association between um, race and wealth that works 
um, negatively for members of certain groups. Um, and it's, it's, you know, and in travel, because you're perennially kind of in, encountering strangers in a strange setting, it, these kind of divisions are highlighted. Um, so we have ongoing, you know, sort of moments of discrimination around Black travelers, especially when they're trying to use any kind of luxury accommodations or transportation. Right, right, yeah. Uh, you know, when you mentioned um, early on in your remarks that um, when railroads become available, uh, that Blacks were frequently in the car right behind the engine. Um, mm -hmm. And someone might think, well, boy, that's their way up front. That must be really good. And then you begin to think about how these trains function. And um, they're probably coal burning or wood burning. Um, mm -hmm. Cinders are flying out from that engine. And where are they going to land first? They're going to land in those first few cars. I imagine that's probably why they were up front. That is absolutely true. And I mean, they had in the 19th century when the cinder problem was especially big, they the they typically had only two passenger cars, but the second one, the one at the back, was known as the ladies' car because the ladies didn't want to travel in the car that was filled with smoke and soot and cinders. It actually sometimes set dresses on fire. So, yeah, right. um, so it was sort they wanted you know, and they and the railroads wanted to appeal to women, so they created these sort of nicer, cleaner, safer cars for women, and that's sort of the beginning of like the class, the the first class car. Um, but yeah, the train at the the front of the engine, it was filled with smoke. It was the, usually actually also the smoking car, like where you were allowed to smoke. So there were many reasons why this was the least um, comfortable place to sit. And one of the things that I had to figure out in the book was like why each place was bad. Back of the bus, mm -hmm. early buses didn't have any springs back there. Oh. The back of the bus rocked and rolled. Um, they had seats above the wheel that were actually really high. So your feet would dangle and they were just acutely uncomfortable. And that's that's where people sat. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, the, 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 the physiology of why these places become the intended place for the, the disadvantaged traveler. Um, so you had a slide up there of the Pittsburgh AAA Club. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't talk about it specifically, I don't think. Maybe, maybe you did. But uh, one of our viewers is is asking, what what role has AAA played in this whole uh, issue of blacks traveling when travel becomes more of an opportunity? Now, I read the fine print on that card, so I I saw what it said at the bottom. But do you want to address it? Occasional. That? Yeah. No. Um. Triple. One of the things. Well, AAA did a lot of things, but one of the things it used to do is the clubs used to be how you got car insurance. If I had more time, I would have explained that. So in this case, this club, you know, this AAA club was like, you join us, you'll get car insurance, but it did not want to take um, black drivers. So AAA had had a kind of long history with that. Um, AAA also used to um, do all the. Sorry, I have to turn this off. This, this is our musical interlude. Triple <laughs> A also used to also also used to be the governing body for car for car racing, and they they uh, refused to let Jack Johnson race because um, they said car racing was for whites only. Though he ultimately bribed someone to race him. So Triple A does have a kind of long murky history around these issues of discrimination. Yeah, I did notice on the bottom of that looked like a membership card or maybe an mm -hmm. application. From it. It's, it said for the white races only. I yeah, believe. no, AAA was one of the many insurers that would not take black customers. So we've got one more question and we can end on this one. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, if you can, ambulances and how those kind of emergency services uh, for, transporta for transportation may have been impacted by uh, color? The biggest problem with ambulances was a problem that actually had to do with hospitals that, um, you know, there were hospitals that took um, colored patients as they were known, and there were hospitals that didn't. Um, and that meant that one of the dangers of driving for African-Americans in the South was um, 
if you got into an accident and you needed emergency services, would you be picked up? Mm -hmm. um, and sorry about this musical interlude. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, there were many stories of people who were not. And I'm just going to ignore that. Um, and um, it was it was a constant danger. Um, sometimes you would be picked up, but only only after, you know, only too late, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've given us an awful lot to think about. I really commend you for the kind of deep dive into the research that you must have uh, undertaken to come up with these, these stories and to, to fit these patterns together and then to share them with us. Um, so I wanna thank you uh, very much for your work and for your presentation tonight. Uh, I also wanna thank all of those of you who tuned in uh, to hear this very intriguing and, um, and challenging sets of stories. Uh, you are uh, welcome, as uh, Emily said uh, earlier, to uh, register for our next program. I also want to remind you, you can uh, purchase Dr. Bay's book, Traveling Black, online uh, at our museum store, uh, or you can come right into the store and buy it. You can also uh, look for a recording of tonight's program um, on our on Lancaster History's YouTube channel in the future. Um, you'll, you'll be greeted uh, as soon as we sign off here with a pop-up survey. We would ask that you take a couple minutes to fill that out. Let us know what you thought about tonight's program and uh, what you'd like to hear in the future. Um, so uh, with that said, I wanna again, thank you, Dr. Bay. It's been a real pleasure and thank all of you for joining us tonight. I wish you all well and have a good evening.